This is your urgent call to action. We are all called to lead in a world in chaos, crisis, and turmoil. Join a pivotal global movement for change to transform the leadership crisis worldwide. Will you play it safe, or will you wake up, step up, and speak out? Like Nelson Mandela did for South Africa and the world, we need a radical new way to think, act, and lead, leading boldly into the future. Join host Ann Pratt, a Harvard fellow and multi-awarded businesswoman, and unlock the best version of yourself to revolutionize leadership with what the world needs now. Greetings to all you future world leaders. Thank you for joining us from around the world. My name is Ann Pratt, formerly from South Africa, and relocated abroad to attend a Harvard Leadership Fellowship in Boston, Massachusetts, in the United States of America. Our bold leader today joins us from the Big Apple in New York City. She spent 20 years in elected office serving the city of New York and ran for mayor against Rudy Giuliani. She is the former president and chief executive officer and current global ambassador for American Jewish World Service, an international organization working in multiple countries around the world on issues of human rights and social justice. She is also the recipient of honorary degrees and serves on several USA and international boards. Stay with us as we explore and uncover why exercising leadership to drive systemic change is in fact a long-term game. Also, her personal mindset teachable moment under a New York bridge in the blackness of night and how meeting Nelson Mandela with subsequent special moments in South Africa, coupled with her grassroots work around the world across continents from South America to countries like South Africa, India and Cambodia, remind and teach us about the importance of cultural intelligence and that it always requires us to meet people where they are, on the ground, and literally. We warmly welcome Ruth Messenger. Welcome to Leading Boldly into the Future. Ruth, it's such a pleasure. It's such an honor. I've been so looking forward to meeting you today. Thank you so much for being part of this conversation. Thank you. It's a privilege to be part of this. Great. You know, you've had a remarkable career. Um, You spent 20 years in elected office in New York. Um, You then went on and you were um, former president and CEO and now global ambassador for the American Jewish Service Organization. Perhaps uh, just, you know, what what have been your career highlights? What really stands out for you? So my original professional training was as a social worker. But then I but then I um, ended up using those skills, I'd like to believe, using those skills all the way through. But I ended up doing local organizing in my neighborhood um, as one of the very first jobs I held, helping um, poor people and people of color fight for their right to housing and to daycare. And that worked slowly, not not immediately, but slowly convinced me that it might be good to run for office. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I spent, as you say, 20 years in local government. I love local government. You have tough moments. You have uh, some difficult decisions to make, but you get to work very closely with the people that you're representing. You get to really, uh, I don't think enough people do this, to be honest, but you get to really listen to what are the things on their mind, what kinds of help do they most need, and to provide that, that help and support for them. And I, I love that. And then, as you say, um, Oh, and I and I want to say, look, it's the, maybe it might not strike people as a good moment, but um, at the end of twenty years in elected office, I made a decision to run for mayor in a very difficult mayoral election, which I lost. But I love the experience of really um, putting it all on the line and challenging the public to think differently than they were thinking. And I think I convinced a lot of people, but not enough. And then I had the amazing opportunity of going to run American Jewish World Service. And I would say that really every moment there was about um, learning about issues of global human rights, understanding the real life experiences of people um, in very different parts of the world um, and being a part of those people's personal struggles for human rights, which was just was amazing at every moment. 
Well, that I mean, that's such a broad, you know, span of different experiences, Ruth. I'm curious. I believe it. You know, you ran for mayor in 1997 against Rudy Giuliani, and I think you were the Democratic Party's first female candidate, if I recall correctly. Yes, I was the first uh, woman nominated for, by the party to run for mayor. And I wish to point out that although there have been some several women running for mayor since, none of them has emerged as the party's candidate. And by the way, we've never had a woman mayor, which makes New York not nearly as progressive as it likes to pretend to be. OK, well, I, you know, I was curious in, in all that experience you've had in local government in, in New York. What do you think has changed in terms of the, the politics and leadership of the day? Back then, you know, perhaps at the time when you were running for mayor in 1997, versus how do you think that has changed in terms of the politics and leadership challenges today? So I think that's an interesting question because I think in general, sadly, politics has gotten less and less attractive, more and more divisive. People um, basically, um, not only the public, but also the candidates that emerge. Um, sort of more interested in picking a fight with the other side and not in doing thoughtful work to improve the situations. Uh, when I was in government, I think there was a great deal more um, commitment to collaboration than there is in some parts of the government now. Um, but we see worldwide that there are fierce partisan efforts to whatever word you want to use, tribal, nativist, um, xenophobic, all of those things. And they're not only, not that those things haven't always been present, Anne, but yeah. they really seem to have a particular and ugly edge to them right now. So that even people who want to build a different kind of approach um, that's more inclusive have a great deal of trouble doing. And what do you think, you know, given that, what do you think the big challenges are now, given this changing character of politics and, and how that plays out? Well, you know, if I'm if I'm in my most um, dismayed moment, I say the challenge is like trying to preserve what we understand to be democracy, mm -hmm. because if if it um, sort of boils down in too many countries to like bitter fighting, power going to people with money. Not that these things haven't happened before, but if if they get worse or as they get worse, um, they lead to um, more and more. Well, let me put it differently, less and less acceptable behavior. And they put the notion of a, a thoughtful democracy um, at risk. Mm -hmm. So right now in the United States, I know we're talking globally, but right now in the United States, you could point to lots of things as areas of division and concern. But I would say that the fact that the racism in the United States has led in one in one direction has led to a fierce effort to deny um, people the right to vote. Yes. Um, and to tend to suppress voter voter activity. That's a really clear and present danger to democracy. And if we pivot slightly to your um, global work in human rights, can you, you know, I know you've had many, many moments um, from a leadership challenge point of view, but could you take us back to one example that has been a particular challenge? Take us back in time. What was the context? You know, what was the mood of the moment? In sure. No, let me let me do that. Let me do that first from my time in government, because one of the things in government, sure. and this is a legitimate question, people who get elected to office and have the privilege of voting on issues, um, basically, most of the time. They just go ahead and vote on the issues. But the fundamental question, that, which sometimes diverg creates diversion, is do you vote based on what you believe, based on your vision, based on your understanding of the issue? Yeah. Or do you vote the way your electoral constituency would want you to vote? And so, obviously, very often those, those are merged and there's not a big deal there. And you know that some people will like your vote and some won't. But you're basically representing the people who elected you, and that's not surprising. They elected yeah. you. But from time to time in elected office, there are moments where elected officials were honest. Everybody has some moments where it's like, do I go ahead and assert my point of view, even though it's not going to be popular with the people I represent? 
So I would just add a couple of those moments, and I'll give you the context of one. It was not life-threatening or position-threatening moment, but in the earlier days of the, it's funny to use the word, of the AIDS pandemic, yeah. uh, going back to the 1980s, there was a proposal in the city council, the New York City legislature, to support needle exchange. Okay. Um, getting uh, letting drug addicts use clean needles yeah. now th this all sounds very obvious now anybody listening to this story would be like well of course that's a good idea mm -hmm. but i uh, when i first heard it along with many people that i represented uh, thought this is the craziest thing i ever heard these people are addicts and we're gonna we're gonna essentially enable their addiction by letting them use clean needles yeah so i said that i was opposed to it mm-hmm um, and I was fortunate that um, the advocates who were the local organizations that were for it um, decided that I uh, was a teachable subject. Okay. Um, so they asked me to come to what was then a secret needle exchange, secret because it was against the law. Yeah. And so it operated late at night, um, mm -hmm. for context, underneath a elevated railroad train in the Bronx. Okay. Where they set up tables with batches of clean needles. Yeah. And they had to bring their used syringes, and then you could trade them in for clean ones. And I went, but I went still thinking, this is like a wacky idea. I don't quite understand why we're doing it. And um, it was a dramatic moment for me, because one, I was, I was, well, I want to say one is they were kind enough to invite me. I'm not sure they would have invited everybody. They thought, they thought as I said, that I was teachable. Yeah. Um, two, uh, I'm pleased that I went, that I've tried always to be open to understanding the issue as other people see the issue. Mm -hmm. So I'm not all these other people. And in that night, um, everyone who came to trade in her his batch of needles was told, I don't know what whether there were pejorative adjectives, but they were told there's like a local legislator sitting a little bit over there on a chair. Remember, this is midnight. Um, if you would like to go speak to her, she's interested in talking to you. Okay. And I'd say that three or four people came over and, you know, it, it makes you feel like a fool when you actually listen to other people. I mean, it took like two minutes. They would say, um, you know, hello, lady. <laughs> I had no yeah. idea. Like, I'm here because um, I'm addicted and I'd love to kick my addiction, but I've not been able to. And meanwhile, when I'm shooting up, I don't want to be sharing needles, and which would mean sharing disease, um, and right now would mean the risk of spreading AIDS. Yes. So I need clean needles because I have to keep shooting up right now, but I don't want to infect my partners or my friends or colleagues. And really, and I mean, it took me two people to say, like, like you know, they were so eloquent, and I was so, I would say, so out of it that I had not been able to imagine yeah. the reason for the program. So. You know, yeah. that doesn't the drama of some of these, but it, but it made a big impact on me because I think that yeah. both before that, but in a much more redoubled and intense way after that, I worked on understanding thing from, uh, things from other people's point of view. And at American Jewish World Service, that was critical because that's really the philosophy of the organization is to find local leaders, local grassroots organizations, whether they're fighting for land rights or um, women's rights, or sexual health and reproductive rights, yeah. or what they know what they most need to move their lives forward to a greater degree of equity and justice. We are unusual as an organization because we fund about 450 groups in 18 countries, but we fund them for what they want. They specify the most urgent. Yeah, we, we ask them, well, what are you doing? For example, we had a big, very big program, thanks to a generous donor. But like, we're looking for people in India who are working against child marriage. Now, I want to be clear to you, we didn't go out and say like, we'd like to talk to any group that wants money and have someone come and say, oh, well, we're in favor of marrying our girls off at 11, will you give us money? No, we, yeah. we had a goal in mind, which was raising the age at which girls are married. But then the question was like, if we want to do that, we need to talk to anybody and everybody in India at a grassroots level who shares that goal and can tell us how they're working on it. And some of them were working on it by educating whatever 12-year-old girls and boys about human rights. 
And yeah. some of them were working on it by telling fathers that what they were doing was putting their daughters at huge risk of illness and even death from being, you know, from, from starting sexual relations early, from having babies before their bodies were formed. Yeah. But there were different groups with different approaches. But, but we listened to the group when it said any group, when it said, like, here's what we want to do. Here's how we're organizing. We offered help. We offered advice. We, um, we urged them to be involved in trying to, you know, change the local law and the local practice. But we funded people based on their understanding of their situation and their idea of how to work for justice, which, you know, given, a, given your, the focus of your video, I would like to say is in my mind very much the way Mandela rose to prominence and ended up fortunately um, being a world leader and one yes. of his country. Yeah. And just to stay in India for a moment, Ruth, is there a particular example in India where, um, you know, there was a very pressing need. Can you take us through a specific example? Not sure if I can. I can't think of a specific example in India. Okay. And, and I want to say it's because I know what you're looking for, but it's because, you know, our whole effort was like, let people tell us what it is they need. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was that was the direction. And I, I feel like there were a thousand moments where people said, this is a better way to do this work. And we were like, OK, OK. You know, I do remember this is not in India, but in um, Central America, um, I worked with a lot of organizations. And in one Central American country, I had a um, New York, a New York congregation that wanted to be really engaged in our work, which lots of people were vaguely interested in my work, but it was nice to have a Jewish congregation say, like, we love the idea that you're working in a country at the grassroots level with, yeah. not with Jews, but according to Jewish values. So we'd love to help. Yes. And so several prominent people from that congregation went to visit this project. It was actually in El Salvador. And when I went to talk with them after they visited, they were full of ideas and their ideas, which I understood from their point of view, but their ideas had nothing to do with what the people on the ground wanted. Yeah. So it was really, that was a difficult moment because they were like, we're, we're people of some means. We want to make this our project. We have lots of money. And by the way, we have lots of doctors and we noticed that the children in this community were sick. Yeah. So we want to organize a rotating group of doctors to go down and treat those children, all of which sounds fine when I say it to you now. But in fact, this was a hugely self-informed community. They were interested in protecting their land rights and fighting their government. Mm -hmm. And by the way, there was nothing sick about their children. Their children were running around in an African climate with runny noses. Okay. And okay. New York doctors, it looked like maybe there's some serious medical problem here, but there wasn't. And, and I was like, they don't, it's not like they couldn't use a little bit of pediatric support, but they're not looking for a rotation of American doctors. And just because that's what you want to do doesn't mean that you will agree. I did spend a lot of time, again, not quite as dramatic as you're suggesting, but I have spent a lot of time in the last 20 years um, telling um, Americans that their instinct, I, I have a not very nice expression for it, their instincts of um, cleaning their closets when they read about a world disaster to get rid of things that they don't need and ask us to deliver them to communities in trouble is just almost always wrong. <laughs> That's and, interesting. And I, I mean, if we can just stay for a moment, Ruth, with that example in Central America, I'm curious, how, how did you navigate the conversation? How did you help pivot out of that and what was the outcome? So, well, that's, that's a, a, of course, a great question. But let's just be clear that, that the desired outcome, which worked in that instance, was to keep these people engaged, but really suggest to them that whatever they thought they had to contribute to this community, mostly what I needed was their money. Okay. Because, because the, the, this was a community in which, as I said, they weren't looking for an outside stream of medical people. If they needed any, help from out volunteer help from outsiders it would have been to plow fields and i didn't have a bunch of new york jews who actually wanted to go plow fields yeah so it was like oh we can support them in other ways but you run into this constantly in the developing world and you must know it from your work in africa that the 
even before you get into differences of race and class, not that those aren't critical, they are, but they're just different cultures. And so how does the culture yeah. work? What is the culture value? You know, yeah. endless to people, the farming communities in South Asia, in Central America, and they would say, do you know that, and here was the opposite example in a sense, do you know that there's a machine that will till this coffee field much more quickly? And why don't we raise the money for AJWS to buy them that machine? And yeah. I was like, it's not the way that community is operating. It's just not what they're doing. Their life is built around when they plow their fields and how they plow their fields. And if you know, if you want to help them, you would do something to prevent global warming, which is destroying the crop rotation. Anyway, it just was so. Uh, I mean, yes, let's stick with that example for a minute. The answer is just me talking to people and and actually telling them the values by which the organization works, which we think are. Those values are in accord with some basic Jewish teach are not exclusive to Jews, but it's the notion, if you believe in it, and the Jewish expression for it is um, that everyone's equally made in the image of whoever makes us all. And so the community organizing priest in El Salvador um, has at least as much right, and in my judgment, actually some more right to dictate um, to us how it is that his community can best be helped. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. are in trouble after um, a natural disaster, which obviously they are. Mm -hmm. But it's not really the shoes in the closets of my constituents in Connecticut um, that they need. And yeah. so, sort of how you do it is uh, learning a little bit of having learned, having learned some patience, some humility and patience myself, and learning how to listen to people articulate their understandings of their situation and their presentations of their needs, then I have to be able to transfer that, first of all, to listen to the people who want to help and yeah. to recognize that they have a strong instinct that they really want to be helpful, that they're really distressed by what they yeah. on the television or what they hear, and then help them understand that the way in which they might first think of helping is not a way that will strengthen the community. Were there any particular techniques or tools that you use to kind of help them see it differently? I don't, I really want to say that I think sort of patience and talking to people, helping them understand the big picture. I guess one technique I use, and I use this with lots of people, in lots of situations, including, and I use it entirely in um, situations in this country as well. Yeah. Is to encourage people to ask the question, why? Okay. So it sounds pretty obvious, mm -hmm. but rather than, um, or let me put it differently, as important as it is to take dramatic steps to address um, segregated housing mm -hmm. in, in which um, the people of color all live metaphorically on the other side of the track. So they live in one part of the neighborhood and not in the other. And people can come up with some really important ideas about we should address this. And I usually those ideas are quite good. Yeah. But I want people to first ask why. Why are things the way they are? Mm. I'll give you an example in America. Yeah. In America, the wealth, not income, but wealth, the, the full value of a white household is 10 times that of a black household. Mm -hmm. Most people don't believe that when you tell them that. Mm. Then you say, well, let's ask why. Yeah. Um, which doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing lots of things about it on the ground, but the question is why? How did things get this way? Mm -hmm. And this is a very simplistic analysis that I'm giving you. But one answer is that wealth is significantly built by home ownership and land ownership mm -hmm. in this country over several hundred years. Yeah. Um, home and land ownership has been denied to people of color. So, so just one point to make to people is that after the Second World War, we created a variety of loan and mortgage programs created by the United States government designed to essentially reward, I don't know if that's the right word, but to recognize the service that veterans had given in the war and make it possible for them to return to society with a, with a foot up, you know, an edge up. Except we deny those programs. Most of those programs were written so that soldiers of color, veterans of color, were not eligible. 
Now, that's just a shocking piece of information, and it went on for years. And so the consequence is that um, somebody who's, who's a renter now um, is, is in some part way a renter because when her grandfather came back from the war in yeah. 1945, he had no way of buying property. So anyway, that's just an example. So, so I would say, yes, what I regularly try to do with people who's good news is, let me make it clear, lots and lots of people want to help. Their instinct is to help people in need, to notify, to notice people who need clothing or food or housing and, and organ, not only help personally, but sometimes organize drives and get ready. And the question is, first of all, is that really the help that those people need? Because it's not up to you to decide what they need. Yeah. And second of all, um, is to ask at the same time as you're providing a useful help on the ground, useful service, to urge people to ask that more difficult question of why. Why is that why are things the way they are? Because in many, many instances, and the answer is, well, the laws are skewed in the favor of some people and not others. Yeah. Well, then what we need to do is change the laws. And it's certainly the good news is I live in a country, you live in a country where it's possible to change the law. Sure. And the challenge is it's a lot less, it's a lot less easy. It's a lot more, it takes a lot longer. And therefore, it's not quite as rewarding as, you know, having a party, raising money, giving it to people to go buy new shoes or whatever the issue is. It's like, we need to change some of these laws. Yeah. And yeah. that's what I do. And I, I guess sort of somewhat counter to the notion that you're pursuing here. I think a great deal of my work is not that dramatic moment, but the work that needs to be done afterwards. So there's a, there's a, a story, I guess you would call it, which is often used to illustrate this, which I think um, I think has direct relevance to the life story of South Africa. It's called in the vernacular, it's called upstream downstream. Okay. The essence of the story is there was a small town by a river and everybody in the town was quite happy. And one day the children in the town were playing on the bank of the river and they saw something in the river and they ran to look and see what it was. And it was a body human body floating face down. And they ran to get the elders and said, there's like a body floating down the river. And the elders mobilized immediately and threw out ropes and dragged in the body and helped the guy cough up the water and, you know, did artificial resuscitation and um, yes. got him breathing again. But at the time he was breathing again, the children were saying, there's three more bodies coming down the river. And so the elders mobilized the whole town and said, like, this is a huge project. We have got to do this. Yeah. And there they were hauling in bodies and helping those people breathe again. And then they looked up and the children were leaving the bank of the river and walking out of the town. And they said to the children, wait a minute, there's work to be done here. Where are you going? And the children said, we're going to see why so many people are falling in the river. It's a wonderful story, Ruth. Yeah. And a great well, illustration. Whether, whether it's a broken bridge or a, or whatever. But that's that's and and I think that in you know, the, in the South Africa story, um, like it's understanding the, the roots of the pro enough, enough of the roots of the problem to tackle it at its core. Of course, of course. And, and, you know, that's a wonderful pivot into South Africa. I know you've traveled to South Africa. I believe you met the wonderful Helen Sussman, uh, who played a key role in South African politics. And as I said, you remind me a bit of her, Ruth. I, you know, she's, She's a remarkable, a remarkable leader, a very strong, courageous woman. What is your greatest memory of South Africa? Oh my God, thousands and thousands of memories. Um, it's one among many countries in, in which I just came to meet unbelievable people at the grassroots fighting to rebuild their communities. I spent lots of time um, in townships where, you know, despite the end of apartheid, despite the work of Madiba, the situation is not very good. And sure. nevertheless, you have people there on the ground saying, like, we, we need to organize. We know what we need. We mm -hmm. want help in putting more creches. We want help in doing um, a better education for our kids. So, you know, I mean, my years at American Jewish World Service were just marked by the privilege of meeting really hundreds of people 
who fight for the rights of their own communities, sometimes against significant odds, mm-hmm. in some cases against in real situations of risk. That's less true in South Africa, more true in some other places. So, so I, I can't tell you I have some particular notions. I did, um, um, I did have occasion. Well, I, as you know, I met Mandela in New York. I had a couple of occasions of of meeting um, the Arch Archbishop Tutu. Yes, the one, he he's just turned ninety years old. I mean, he's unbelievable. I know, uh, absolutely. I want to say about Helen Zuzman, who I think was a hero. That like one of the things that probably the thing that I love the most about her story, which is directly related to your research, is here she is, um, a woman of some means, a woman who has challenged the electoral system, get herself elected. Um, you know, it's not never easy for women to win office, yeah, um, or of uh, the parliament, and she saw the greatness of Mandela and his promise for healing the country. And so she took on herself the job of going to visit him in prison. Yes. Constantly. Yes. And coming in, basically reporting to her colleagues in parliament, who I think in general, she would say this, couldn't have been less interested. Yeah. That, you know, it yeah. was a report. She did it again, the, uh, what I admire is I know she did it over and over and over again. Yes. Uh, and so he was clearly a strong influence on her, but it was also the yes. way in which she worked to share that with a, with a broader public. Yes. So I love that. Um, and, and, and then I got, I got to know a woman that you may know, um, who's one of these people that you can only call a force of nature. So do you know Helen Lieberman? I know of her. I haven't met her personally. So Helen Lieberman, um, so white Jewish South African woman. Her story, basically, I'm now not doing it a good service, but but basically as a young woman in a fairly privileged household, um, picking her career path, majored in, I think she was, I think she was being trained as a social worker, but with a particular interest in um, speech therapy. Yes. And so she was connected to one of the big hospitals where she was helping children who were on the wards there with their particular needs. And as she tells the story, she went to the hospital one day and asked for the child that she'd been working with, I think, on a weekly basis for some time. And the hospital staff said, oh, no, the child has been discharged. Mm -hmm. Helen was, oh, well, then I have to go see her where she lives. And then the people at the hospital said, oh, no, you can't do that. She lives in a township and whites can't go in there. Mm -hmm. That was like really her first understanding of how appallingly segregated her society was and she went um and she kept back and then she ended up long story running a a network of uh, foster care and other services for children all all over the country and in a variety of ways and after school program i mean just amazing enterprise Valabantu is what it's called and she stepped down from leadership but quite a, quite an extraordinarily large social service child focused um agency again working with people all over the country virtually all people of color giving them in their communities and in their families the help that they needed but take us back to you know your mandela moment when you met him in new york soon after his release well you know I'm, look, I'm as capable as anybody else of, of, a, of, of lunatic hero worship i was by then um um, I guess I was 50 years old. You know, the the story around the world of his release was unbelievably dramatic. The notion that he was going to come out like virtually immediately take over running his country is it's just an astounding story. I mean, you were in the middle of it there. So, it's, but I was really fortunate because David Dinkins was then the mayor of New York City, the one black mayor that we've had in New York City. Yeah. And one of his first moves through sets of channels and connections that he had was to invite Mandela in the, you know, that notion that you have of come and we'll give you a key to our city. And I think actually when I reflect on it a little bit, it's really probably quite amazing that Mandela came because he had he had his own challenges um, in the country. And he had a very busy schedule and had to yes, try to build a, build a country and build a democracy. But he came, he was the host of the city. I got to sort of sit with him during one, not not unfortunately for a long private conversation, much as I would have wished, but just to listen to him speak. 
And as you know, his manner is, is extraordinary for any human being and for a human being who had lived through what he had lived through. It's, it's really unbelievable. Yeah. So what do you think, you know, having met, having listened to him, having met him briefly, what stands out for you, Ruth, in terms of Mandela's? And you, you, you made reference to being a lunatic, you know, hero worshiper. But I mean, you know, in, in the quiet of the night or the sensibility of the day, what really stands out for you as being relevant in terms of Mandela's leadership? Today? Well, I mean, it tracks, for me at least, it tracks some of the things I've already talked about, and that is his total passion for his country and its people, mm-hmm. his total commitment to seeing. Well, maybe maybe more than I can do, seeing good in all people, you know, and thinking about how what he might do to change the lot of so many um, South Africans who had suffered so severely from apartheid, but at the same time to not alienate the universe of international figures, uh, business figures, the people who had to be brought together around around their love for their country. Mm-hmm. And they're separate, um, uh, you know, to to build. And I just think it's an amazing life story of commitment to a set of ideals and values. And we we don't have enough of those, and we like to admire them wherever they come. But to see it in somebody who went through the travails that he did, and who spent time in mm-hmm. that jail, which you can visit on Robben Island to get some notion of what we're talking about, mm-hmm. and then to come out in every one of his public presentations as not being somebody who hated people. Mm-hmm. Someone with a, with a love for all humanity and a fierce determination to do everything he could to build the country. Mm-hmm. Not enough people like that to admire. So Yeah, absolutely. And, and so, you know, I know you also took a trip to Robben Island and visited his cell. What was that moment like for you? Well, I want to say with great respect for the country, the notion or the decision, and I have no idea whose decision it was, I don't know if it was Mandela's or others, but the notion of having the tour guides be people who were imprisoned on Robben Island is just, that's in and of itself was like amazing. Because you know you want to see it, you know, it's, I've been there I think twice, maybe three times. Yeah, It's a piece of the story of the country, but, but you don't realize, I didn't realize I should say it that way until like we're sort of like, picking our time and paying for the trip. And then you meet a guard. And then I was told by all of the guard, all of the tour guides. So people can tell you their personal story, not only about their time on Robin Island, but about the struggles that they were in before that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. own one or two of the people who were active in those very early days of the yeah. head of American Jewish World Service, the current head of American Jewish World Service, Robert Bank, is a cousin of Dennis Goldberg, so I got to okay. meet. Him. So I got to meet Dennis Goldberg when I was there and talk just, to him. Just for our audience, just if you can share who Dennis Goldberg is. Oh, and- well, Dennis Goldberg was was the one of the activists, and I think one of the relatively few white activists who was right in the whatever word you want to use central central committee of the early days of the ANC when all of their work was illegal when they were planning and plotting their own efforts for which um, a, a large group of them got arrested and sent to jail. Yeah. And actually what's interesting about his story is that in, in, in a very segregated way, when he was also sent to prison, he was actually sent to a different prison. Yeah. And sent to Pretoria prison. He wasn't sent to Robben Island where the rest of them were sent. Being there, having the privilege of, of, of touring um, with, as I say, with people who've been in prison there, it's just, I think Mandela, for me, Mandela is a hero, would have been a hero in any event. It's one of the most dramatic stories of the 20th century in every regard. And it's clear that that story, that is the change in the the country, um, ending of the official apartheid, is rather more than in some cases a one-person story. It doesn't mean there there weren't lots of other people, but it was a story by a leader. And then to have had the additional experiences of Knowing that that was a hero story of essentially, I guess my my century. Um, yes. It was to actually meet him, um, see his surroundings, and have the opportunity, as I said, to to through American Jewish World Service to do serious work in the country. And and when you do, the longer you're there in a country, 
and especially with American Jewish World Service, you're getting to meet the people on the ground who are still struggling to make change. And so I had that experience. That's, that's absolutely amazing. Switching gear a little more on a lighter note in terms of your personal to some fun fast facts. What is one of your greatest reads, one of your greatest novel, not necessarily a novel, but one of, what is one of your greatest books? Well, some of the last books I read, I don't want to dignify them with that. I have been privileged to read the, uh, to me, read Long Walk to Freedom. Um, okay. um, so, so in the... In the spirit of what we're honoring today, I'll, I'll list that as one of my favorite books, which it is. Yeah. yeah. You know, what, what have been some of your favorite cities to visit in the world? I'll answer that differently. First of all, I'll say that I, there are some of the most obvious major cities in the world that I've not visited. I do love London, but except when I was a child and don't remember it, I've never been to Paris. And um, I've not been to any of the cities in Spain. So I want to answer the question differently and, and say that through American Jewish World Service, I was privileged to spend time in at least 20 countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Those, those countries are picked because those are places where we're meeting with very poor people, um, mm -hmm. working, with, working side by side with them. But I'm often asked by people, or I was asked when I was um, doing more with American Jewish World Service, I would be asked like, so what are your favorite countries? Mm -hmm. And uh, there's any way to answer that. But I, I did say, here's what I said. I said, um, I still say this. Look, of the countries I was privileged to spend time in through my work, uh, my favorite one is India because it's the most complicated um, story of democracy and social change. Um, and a continuing inability to address its unbelievable problems of, of poverty. Yeah. So I have to open it. But then I would say to people, going a little further, but the countries that where favorite is not the right word, but the two countries where we work that challenge me the most and therefore okay. engage are Cambodia and Haiti. Okay. And the reason for that is that those are two countries in which I believe it's fair to say that virtually all of their current problems were caused by my government. Wow. That's a big statement. I feel, I feel attached to them and I feel a sense of moral obligation. Mm -hmm. for the work. Not, I felt that in many places. I love working in South Africa. I worked in some, a lot of work in and on the issues and in, in not, not in because it's basically been too dangerous, but on the issues in um, Sudan, on the issues in um, Burma. Myanmar. So I, there, each one of these countries is one I'm attached to in some way or other. Sure. But India has like sort of a, a little bit of everything that struggles with democracy, yeah. the struggle with corruption, the of poverty. But but in, in Cambodia, to some extent, and in Haiti, I think to a total extent, um, I can't go without feeling responsible. So, yeah, that's interesting. And what, um, just one more, what, what's one of one of your favorite childhood memories, Ruth? I was privileged to grow up in a wonderful family with like very good um, education opportunities. Um, like many people in my generation, my earliest um, exposure to the issue of race um, as a problem was um, traveling from the northern part of the United States to the south and seeing um, the very visible signs, which you're used to from South Africa, but which yeah. did exist in the south of whites and, and uh college in, um, in America in the South and seeing that and then that being an opening with my parents to learning that the country was fraught with problems and difficulties. I had a fortunate childhood and I had, must say I had had the wonderful experience subsequent to that of not only holding interesting jobs but having a wonderful family raising three children and now having eight grandchildren and three great-grandchildren. Well, that's that's a, a wonderful circle of life. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, perhaps in closing, um, you know, in our sort of final moments, what, what would you say are the biggest challenges? What are the biggest wisdoms and insights you would pass on to our younger generation um, in terms of dealing with the challenges that we face? Oh, I love it. Let me put that question backwards. I actually think one of the things that gets me up every morning mm -hmm. is the fact that there's a lot of engaged energy on the part of the next generations. 
I can point to all of the issues of um, extra privilege and comfort, but the fact that all over the world, environmental movements are being led by people who are quite literally one quarter my age in the communities of color in the States to try to address some of these longstanding issues. So I guess the only ad- advice I have to them is that, which I think they've already figured out, is that none of these are going to be easily won battles. And so, yeah. yes, you talk about all of the issues, but you have to organize, you have to set your sights small changes, which will hopefully lead to larger changes, because you can't realize the vision that you have, which hopefully will sustain you, you can't realize all at once. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Ruth Messenger, it's been such an honor, such a great privilege to meet you. I've loved chatting to you. I can't wait to meet you in person. I look forward to that. Yeah. And thank you so much for contributing to this conversation. And uh, just thank you for sharing your wisdom. And make sure that Now, when the book and the videos are coming out, I will definitely do that. There is an unvarnished authenticity about Ruth Messenger, which is powerful, compelling, and deeply connecting. She has an empowered and empowering social worker ability to dine with paupers and walk and talk with mayors, presidents, and kings, treating them all with equal dignity, respect, and humility. And yes, O Lord, it is hard to be humble, especially when we demand that we are perfect in every way. Ruth Messenger has a confident boldness to admit when she gets things wrong. And yet many or most tend to blame, name and shame others when we make a mistake, when in reality, for every finger we have pointed forward at another, there are three facing back at ourselves. Exercising bold leadership the way Ruth Messenger has done, whether in elected public office or working in multiple countries and communities around the world, requires that we step out of our ivory tower or our high-end boardroom or our corridors of power. Because real transformation and understanding the perspective of others happens on the beat of the street or under a Brooklyn Bridge. So until next time, remember that leading boldly requires that we make thoughtful, clear choices. And bold leadership calls us out to take bold action, just one small step at a time. One small step for you, but together, one giant step for humanity. So come back soon, share with your friends, and join our global leadership movement for change. Because if not you, then who? And if not now, then when? Take care and take thoughtful, bold action. Thank you for listening to this episode of Leading Boldly into the Future. Please find links and connections mentioned in this show in our blog and never miss an episode by subscribing at ann-pratt.com. That's A-N-N-E-P-R-A-T-T.com. May these insights from inspiring industry leaders, remarkable disruptors, and courageous champions of change bring forth a brand new you, emboldened, empowered, and ready to inspire hope. Come back soon, share with your friends, Sign up on ann-pratt.com and join our movement for change. Why? Because the world needs you to lead boldly too.